If I say rock and roll, what do you think about? There's a decent chance that the idea of rock and roll conjures up high energy songs featuring electric guitars and drum kits. That's a pretty reasonable instinct. Many, though not all, rock and roll songs have those characteristics. If, on the other hand, I say jazz, you probably think of brass instruments, improvisation, and main music teachers. Why do you suppose I just hurled a chair at your head, Neiman? Again, reasonable instinct. Brass instruments and improvisation are hallmarks of lots of jazz music. These are huge simplifications of complicated and varied music genres, but they're meant to illustrate a simple point. The typical understanding of a genre basically consists of a list of characteristics. If we go down the list and a work of art checks most of the boxes, then hey, it must fit into that genre. Ed Sikov, our constant companion throughout this series, can help us develop this idea a bit more thoroughly. He introduces us to the idea of conventions. A convention is a widely used and accepted device in an art form, or more broadly, an artistic practice or process or device that is commonly accepted and understood within a given culture. This definition applies to entire art forms. There are certainly conventions that apply not just to particular film genres, but to the medium more broadly. The shot-reverse-shot technique is a far-reaching convention, especially in mainstream Hollywood films. Other conventions apply to particular genres. The first-person point-of-view shot, for instance, is a convention of the horror genre. As a quick side note, this is a good time to mention that film conventions take all kinds of forms. Many conventions have to do with particular uses of the technical elements that we explored in the first five videos in this series, but there are also storytelling conventions. The plot of a teen film, for instance, is pretty likely to feature a big jock with a crew cut, or an overbearing teacher or principal as a central antagonist. But Sikov adds some nuance to the simplistic understanding of genre characteristics that we started with. First, he emphasizes the fact that conventions are widely used and accepted. There's nothing right or wrong about a particular technique. A filmmaker isn't doing something incorrectly if they don't follow a convention. Rather, they're simply breaking away from the accepted, socially constructed standard. Second, he points out that these conventions are understood within a given culture. That is, it's not generally useful to think about universal conventions of monolithic genres or universal conventions of film as an entire medium. Though there are some, like the shot-reverse-shot convention that we mentioned, that are pretty far-reaching. We certainly can't think of different film traditions as totally isolated from one another, especially in a highly globalized world, but it's still important to be wary of making overly broad claims about universal conventions. Without a doubt, certain conventions arise for primarily artistic reasons. To continue with a previous example, the convention of first-person POV shots in horror films probably became popular because of the psychological effect that it generates in viewers. Perhaps it unsettles them by placing them in the shoes of a killer or a monster. By having the audience look through the eyes of the antagonist, maybe a director forces a viewer to reckon with the idea that voyeurism, or perhaps even sadism, is central to the horror genre itself. That's not a moral judgment of the horror genre. I'm just trying to illustrate that certain conventions arise because of their artistic potency, because of their ability to get at questions central to certain genres. On the other hand, certain conventions probably arise out of convenience. Maybe the heavy use of jump cuts in action films circa 2010 is intended to work towards some artistic end, but there's also a decent chance that they're used to speed up the process of filming a fight scene. So we can do a lot with this basic idea of a genre as a set of characteristics or conventions. But our understanding of how we group works of art together, how we think of films as parts of historical traditions rather than as isolated creations, can be deepened if we go beyond this straightforward definition. To do this, we'll return to Ed Sikov. Sikov brings in a framework explored by Rick Altman, another film scholar. Altman presents two different approaches to understanding genre, a semantic approach and a syntactic approach. Critics who study film genres semantically have concentrated on the similarities of characters, locations, lighting styles, and so on within a given genre. In other words, each genre has a set of relatively fixed meanings. This approach lines up pretty closely with the first definition that we developed. The syntactic approach is a bit more complicated. Syntactically oriented scholars, in contrast, describe genres in terms of variable relationships between structured, ordered elements. Instead of stressing what remains constant within a genre, syntactic critics find a much more fluid and changeable set of films as constituting a consequently more fluid and changeable genre. That's a bit abstract. The example we get from Sikov and Altman and yet another film theorist, Jim Kitsis, points out a few tensions central to the Western genre to make this a bit more concrete. A Western is about the West as desert versus the West as garden, and nature versus culture, and the individual versus the community. 
In other words, a movie is a Western if it addresses some of these central tensions or dilemmas. It need not even be set in the American West to fall into this category. Let's work on an example of our own in order to really develop our understanding of this distinction. I'll give an example of a semantic and a syntactic definition of another genre. Seeing as this video comes out in December, we'll go with Christmas movies. A basic semantic definition is pretty easy to come up with because there are some features that Christmas movies tend to share. They're set around the holidays, they often feature family members returning home, maybe from the big city as a central plot device, the idea of the Christmas spirit is probably important, maybe Santa Claus or elves make an appearance, and reds and greens and warm lighting probably persist throughout the film. A syntactic definition, on the other hand, is not quite as straightforward to come up with because we can't just list off common features of Christmas movies, but if we look below the surface of these features, we can start to see some tensions emerging. Maybe an emphasis on Santa and the Christmas spirit underscores the relationship between belief and cold hard logic. Perhaps we could think of Christmas movies as films that examine the struggle of traditional ideals against a rising tide of unsentimental Scroogeism. Let's also look at this idea of a family member returning home from the big city. This plot device actually reveals some important tensions that lots of Christmas movies deal with. Maybe a Christmas movie is any film that addresses the relationship between individual agency and the obligations that come from being a member of a family. Maybe it's about the tension between the possibility of self-reinvention and the inevitability of return. Can we make something new of ourselves, or will we always, no matter what, go home for the holidays? This example illustrates an important point. We don't have to choose between being semantic or syntactic theorists of film genre. Identifying coming home for the holidays pointed us towards the dichotomy between self-reinvention and inevitable return. I think this shows that the semantic and syntactic approaches can work in tandem. There are likely to be common features of films that we group together, but there's a good chance that those common features can point us towards important tensions. By this point, we've developed a pretty thorough understanding of how we might define genre and applied our two paradigms to a range of genres. So how can we use this understanding of genre to make sense of a film, to understand how a work is delivering meaning? Perhaps the simplest way to apply some of these methods is to allow our ideas about a genre to scaffold the initial questions that we ask about a film. If a film seems to be presenting itself as a western, it's probably worth looking into what it's saying about nature versus culture, and the individual versus the community, to use the framing that we're given by Sikov. But understanding genre is perhaps even more useful when we're trying to make sense of films that challenge our expectations. If you read film reviews, you've probably come across critics describing movies as subversive. But what are these films subverting? In many cases, critics are pointing out the way in which a film goes against the expectations set up by earlier films that we perceive as entries in the same genre. By forming some ideas about what a particular genre entails, perhaps using both a semantic and a syntactic approach to do so, we can equip ourselves to understand how a film is challenging our expectations, how it's using our preconceived ideas to make a point about a particular theme, about a particular genre, or even about film itself. This gets at one of the most interesting things about genre. We can't really apply it to individual films because our understanding of a particular genre is created by a history of other films that we group together. Up to this point in the series, we focused on technical elements, shot composition, editing, cinematography, and so forth. These are things that we can think about within the context of a single film. Certain techniques are, of course, imbued with meaning when multiple films use them, but we can still think about the emotional resonance, the meaning generated by a technique within a single film. It's not really the case with the idea of genre. We can't reflect on how a film fits into a mold without having a thorough understanding of that mold. We can't understand how a film challenges our expectations without knowing what those expectations are. And this is where film studies gets really interesting. We've built up an understanding of the building blocks, technical elements that make up particular films, but considering genre is our first real step towards broadening our perspective, towards looking at multiple films in conjunction with one another. By adding genre to our analytical toolkit, we've equipped ourselves to start thinking about the story of cinema beyond the individual films that make up its history. Thanks for watching.